Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee and or occasionally wine and talking about anything and everything. We may use explicit language and will almost certainly drop F-bombs, but that is not the point or the drive of the content, so consider us PG-13. There will be rants and raves and occasional readings. There will be conflicting creative advice driven by very different points of view. Your hosts today are Chaz Brenchley and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 23, live from World Fantasy Con, Marie Brennan. It just occurred to me, I almost never drink either coffee or wine. Am I allowed to be here? I, ooh, I don't know. Okay. Allowances can be made. I I drink dessert wine sometimes. Is that enough? Muscat? Uh, Well, Muscat or port? um, Port, um, uh, uh, um, I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, Starts with an S. Um, So not Madeira. uh, So turn, that was it. Uh, Have some Madeira. Madeira. Uh, I, I drink tea. Does that qualify? People have drunk tea, sure. Okay. Tree, yeah, there's, there's been tea drinkers. Okay. I yes. think it's fair. I think mostly, it's fair. Mostly for me, it's cocktails or wine. Yeah. But. Well, I had a little sulfite issue. My flare husband up, has so, that, yeah. So distilleries, you can only really trust a distillery. <laughs> <laughs> None of this, well, I want you to be alcoholic. Oh, too much. I'm going to stop you now with the sulfite. So <laughs> trust your distillery. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So welcome. And I know you often go by Bryn, but you're... Marie Brennan is your screen name, as it were, in the great movie screen theater of book writing. Yeah, Mar- Marie Brennan is the name that actually, you know, gets out there and works. Bryn just sits around at home doing nothing. So, cool. Well, <laughs> except sure. writing and scribbling and great stuff. I can do there too. You have... I can tell from your books, you have a passion for world building also. Yes, actually, um, my undergraduate degree was in archaeology and folklore, and then I went to graduate school in cultural anthropology and folklore. So I basically, I tell people I didn't choose my majors by saying, what will be useful to me as a fantasy writer? But that is more or less what I ended up in as my field. <laughs> well, that's certainly as useful as any other undergraduate degree ever was. Yeah, pretty much. And, <laughs> and the advice I have given to, like, there's teenagers at our karate dojo, they're going off to college, and I say, here's how you pick your major. Go through the course catalog, mark classes that look interesting, whatever field has the most classes marked, go major in that. Because then you'll actually go to class and might actually do the reading. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I think sometimes you have people that are fascinated by their topic but they didn't ever learn how to string ideas together. Yeah, I did enough TAing and teaching of courses that I I was on the front lines of the, oh, oh, honey, did anybody ever teach you how to do this? Textbooks alone. I mean, I've, I have read a few that have been just, wow, this draws you in just in the textbook of cultural anthropology. That's fascinating. And then there's the ones like, Okay, if I finish this chapter, I can have a drink, right? <laughs> That's the reward yeah. system of finishing your yep. college classes. Published academics are not necessarily, in any sense of the word, good writers. So did you study more of the Western version or the Eastern version? Um, so when I did archaeology, I sort of ricocheted around a little bit. I worked on digs in a variety of places and time periods. Uh, when I did cultural anthropology in graduate school, what I ended up studying was role-playing games. Uh, because I was trying to do something that would be both anthropology and folklore. I love you so much right now. (laughs) (laughs) If you look at role-playing games, they are a form of oral storytelling. And so the folklore side, that worked really well. And then the anthropology side, you know, for a hobby that has this reputation of being something that, oh, you know, antisocial loners do, it is a social activity. It is it's deeply social. social. I think it's yeah. a lie. Okay, readers, listeners, wherever you are, it is a lie that role players are loners. Yes. Like, <laughs> they desperately, desperately want to bond writers together. Writers <laughs> are loners. We're the ones making up stories on our own. Role players are doing it with people. Yeah, our, our friend Juliet McKenna, the author, um, was eavesdropping on one of her sons who was basically so you know he was deep in an online Mm -hmm. role-playing game and she realized suddenly he was talking to somebody in israel and somebody in russia and somebody in the far east yeah and yeah you know he's totally socializing it's it's made the world smaller too which can be a really good thing it's i i am comforted by the ways that people now can talk to each other without having to go through what the official political statement is or the newspaper headings or yeah or even sometimes um the writers of books Mm. Like um, my grandparents were the generation that they read Souls and Itzen and said, ah, one can never trust Russia. <laughs> never trust Russia. I'm like, 
we'll, we'll wait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait just a minute here, because one could read certain things about American writings and say, oh, my God, don't <laughs> trust America. Yeah. <laughs> so, so your early world, how did you transition from reading about role playing? Did you did you write fanfic or did you write uh, character background stories? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I did actually do fanfic um, at a point where I, I did not know the term fan fiction. I had no idea this was a thing. I just did the thing as a kid that like, kids in general will do where you're making up stories. And in a lot of cases, it's going to be stories that are somehow connected to what you've been reading, whether it's like, I'm going to insert my own character into this story, or if it's something where you want to do something else in that world. Mm. Uh, one of the earliest things that I did a lot of, I read read the ElfQuest comic books when I was in like junior high and high school and I I didn't actually really want to do stories about the existing characters I wanted to make up my own tribe of elves in the ElfQuest world and this actually was connected to a role playing game because Chaosium put out an ElfQuest RPG they did I was going to say I thought in, they had in some, hindsight yeah. it was not very good like now that I know no. RPGs I look <laughs> at that and go oh uh, um, but at the time, I didn't know anybody who did RPGs. And so my friend and I, who she also liked the comic books, we got this RPG book and it had a section on how to make a character and even how to come up with things about like their appearance and such and like, you know, maybe their background. And so we made some characters while we waited to find people who knew how to do this RPG thing. And we didn't find anybody and we made more characters and we came up with stories about the characters and, you know, it snowballed from there. Um, I also had some uh, uh, fanfic for the TV show Highlander. Um, oh, well. Yeah, like you do. Oh, you know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, I, I'm just due to Claire. Suddenly I'm a little warm. <laughs> yeah. Adrian was pretty. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I was much more interested in Mythos because give me the snarky character every time. Well, okay, fair enough. Uh, but, yeah, so I, I definitely did a bunch of that kind of stuff, but I... The, the world building stuff started to kick in more um, around about college because that was when I started doing archaeology and folklore and so on. And there was a chunk of time where I was trying to like file the serial numbers off of the ElfQuest idea in order to do a thing with it because by then I knew I, I would need to do that if I wanted to use these stories. Um, and I've been going through my old notebooks from college and graduate school just because I'm going to be sending them off to the library that archives my papers. And I'm finding the sections where I was working on that and I'm looking at it going, wow, this is so on brand for me because my solution was to world build the shit out of it in an attempt to make it be not elf quest <laughs> in ways that like now I look at it and go, yeah, but half that world building doesn't make sense. But that was still my approach was, okay, what can I do with building up the society in these interesting ways? And, you know, that, that was just how I approached it. <laughs> no, I can see it. So uh, what's a then versus now? Give me an example of some of a, um, what I, yeah, that's clearly before it was, it can't be like that. So I'm going to change this and yeah, make well, it because um, you know. the, the group that I had come up with, um, again, also being on brand and who I am, um, I had a bunch of elves riding around with giant panthers instead of giant wolves because cats. Well, cats are cool. Exactly. You know? um, but I was coming up with lots of complex uh, kinds of hierarchies and such, for which for a hunter-gatherer group, like anthropologist says no. Like, you can get hierarchy in non-agrarian like societies, but it pretty much requires like the Pacific Northwest, where you had such abundant food resources that they could have a very stratified society, even though it was all hunter-gatherer stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was building up all of these, like, you know, organized social structures in ways that I'm like, that's just, that's not how hunter-gatherers tend to roll. Uh, so yeah, that's the kind of thing that I look at now and go, that doesn't really make sense. Um, Wait, what is, uh, of your books, which, which is your favorite world? What, what is the um, one that you go back to when you lie at night and think I should write another one of those? Well, I don't quite have the, I think I should write another one of those. Um, I've, uh, I've got a couple of different things, um, actually, also sort of around the time that I was trying to world build the crap out of my ElfQuest fan fiction, I started making a world that I intended to be something, initially I thought of it as a, a shared world kind of deal, like Thieves World or something. Mm -hmm. I never did anything with that because strangely when you're like 17 years old nobody really wants to like you know play in your world play, play in your shared world at least not on a professional level um and also i had literally set up an entire world which is way too large to be useful for a shared world you want something where the characters you will run into meet. each other <laughs> yeah um I 
That was, that was a several online RPGs, similar idea. Yeah. We're, we're all playing this E multiplayer, and I've never, ever seen you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, we, but I did write short stories and such there, and eventually I wanted to do a novel series that will probably never mm-hmm. happen. But the short stories, um, I actually have pulled them together for an ebook collection for Bookview Cafe that's coming out. Uh, I don't know when this is going to air, but November 19th. So awesome. soon as What's of when The Nine Lands, which is the name of the setting. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, The Nine Lands is going to be out on the, the 19th, and it's interesting to look at it now because most of the stories are among some of the first short stories that I wrote and sold, and so there is a little bit of the, like, oh, it, it, it's not as sophisticated as I would like it to be now, and uh, it, it's not as polished, but, you know, I'm a lot of those stories were major firsts for me. It was like the first story I was paid for through a contest, the first story I sold, like a bunch of firsts are in there. So, so when, when you were putting the collection together, mm-hmm. did you were you tempted to rewrite? I did a few changes only because um, there was one story, one of the uh, cultures in this world is kind of a like itinerant nomadic people um, inspired in some ways by the Romani in the real world. Um, but at the time that I was writing those stories, I used the word gypsy, mm-hmm. which for yeah. Romani people now, like that is basically, that that is a slur. That yeah. is not a word that we should be using. So my usual policy with my short story collections is I don't rewrite mm-hmm. because I'm it's all stories that I've published yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, this is what yeah. it is. Yeah. I don't feel the need to like hide this is what I actually yeah. sold. Uh, yeah. But in that case, I looked at that and went, there is no yeah. good reason for me to leave that in there. So I did make that change. I, I could see that that's going on a lot in the different world right now you know disney pulled song of the south there's yeah, a lot of let's, <laughs> let's clean up the things that we did wrong yeah and and just be i think we can all be more sensitive and people are like well i stubbornly wrote that you know 10 years ago and i'm not going to change it I'm like yeah, but 10 years ago, I was kind of a dick, and I'm better now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. And this was something where it was a simple change, because it was really just the word. And yeah. I'm like, okay, all I have to do is replace that word, because it's not Romani culture in yeah. the way that that society is built. Yeah. They've got their own thing going on. Um, and, you know, again, in ways that I'm like, oh, I could probably do much more interesting things now than I did 11 years ago. But I'm I'm not going to spend all my time backtracking. Mm-hmm. Uh, for stuff that's more recent, the series that I just finished is The Memoirs of Lady Trent, which... It, so you've got like a uh, secondary world, you know, it's in another setting. It, it's sort of world and a half because it's very clearly based on this world in the Victorian period, but it is not our world because that gave me some freedom to change things around where I wanted to. Um, and so I'm drawing a lot of inspiration there from real world cultures, but not being married to like what exactly was going on in 1843 in that place. Is there a... Is there a genre that, because they have alternative history, I mean, Ter- Harry Turtledove writes alternative history all mm-hmm. the time. What is the, I'm just taking something that's kind of history and then just plain different? Yeah, is I, there I, a, I don't is there know, a word like, like Guy Gavriel K does a lot of yeah, that as totally well. Yeah, totally Where you can certainly point to go, okay, this is like Moorish Spain right here, yeah. but it's not Moorish yeah. Spain. It's yeah, just I, mean, that. I, I just call that historical fantasy. Yeah, I, except for me, historical fantasy is like my Onyx Court books, where they are set in London and actual London history uh, okay. with fantasy yeah, elements. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, like my my Barnabas, if anybody yeah. ever loves him, will be, it's historical fantasy noir. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I, yeah. I don't know of a term for that kind of thing, though I do feel like there should be one. It, it feels, I don't know, but so I'm hoping we get a word. It's a spectrum, right? Yeah. Because um, there's lots of world building and fantasy, like you see this in Tamara Pierce's books, where countries are clearly analogs to real world cultures, yeah. but a little bit less of a specific time period. Um, like some of the writing I've done recently is for the role playing game and card game Legend of the Five Rings, which right. is very much based on historical Japan. Mm. But it is very consciously and deliberately the courtliness of the Heian period and the warfare of the Sengoku period and the bureaucracy of the Tokugawa <laughs> period all at once. Like, yeah. So, and, and I mean, that's fine because it means that there's a bunch of different flavors you can play with in that setting and that is very good for what it's trying to do. But that's something where you can look at it and say, yeah, this is definitely inspired by Japan, but it's not a specific point in time. The way with the memoirs, it is very clearly the Victorian era. Sure. Right. But and it's not so specifically this world. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I can, you know, have different events happening. I can put countries in slightly different places so that they're next to each other when I need them to and be. And you can have dragons. And I can have dragons without needing to ask the question of how would that have changed history? Yeah. Because I know this is something people got hung up on, some people got hung mm-hmm. up on with Naomi Novik's Temeraire books. Uh-huh. Yeah. That they said, okay, if dragons have been under harness mm. since the Roman period, mm. you would not get the Napoleonic yeah. War in yeah. a recognizable yeah. form. Absolutely. But I mean, that didn't bother me as a reader, okay. because to me, that's just the buy-in for that series mm-hmm. is, okay, it's the Napoleonic War with dragons, yeah. go. Yeah. Okay. As a writer, 
I would have gotten hung up on it. I would have been like, oh, but I need to think about this and I need to think about that. And I wanted the freedom to do things like there's still colonialism and problems like that in Lady Trent's world, but they don't play out the same way they did in our history because there aren't the same set of global dynamics at work. Um, so like China, for example, the, the Chinese equivalent is much more of an equally competitive power as opposed to being at the sort of tail end of the Qing dynasty where it was very kind of corrupt yeah. and, and having problems. Um, that's one where I, I don't have that, the way you phrase it of like, you know, oh, I should write more in that setting. I'm certainly happy to do that when I get ideas, but I don't have that yen to do more with it. Now, the thing that I, I do have, which um, is, is sort of, if you want to see like my, my most current thoughts on world building, um, uh, there's a trilogy that my friend Alice Helms and I are, are writing together called Rook and Rose that we just sold to Orbit Books. The first book is probably going to be out in fall of 2020. Um, and I s only slightly jokingly refer to that trilogy as when anthropologists attack. Because um, <laughs> Alice is also an anthropologist. Like we met on a, an archaeological dig in, in Wales and Ireland, actually. Um, and so it's a second, like fully secondary world fantasy. And we have world built the shit out of that place. <laughs> nice. like, um, because is this I, one of those you get down to the, okay, how do, where are the bathrooms? How do they do sanitation systems? Um, I, uh, you know? there, there might be some information on sanitation that we have worked out yeah um and uh i mean we don't like bring it to the forefront in the books but there are lots of things where partly i think because there are two of us and so anytime something comes up there's sort of increased odds that one or the other of us will say well what can we do with this like how can we make this interesting uh as opposed to hitting the like uh i don't feel like working on it <laughs> i'm just gonna let it slide um so yeah, it's a, a very richly world-built setting. We're writing the trilogy there. I've got a short story that I've written in that setting, which I need to revise and, and try to sell. And it's something where I would love to do short fiction around the books mm -hmm. because well, there's so many aspects of it that we could dig into. That brings an interesting question of, do you short story something and go long or is it long and then short stories? Or is there any rhyme or reason to the relation of short stories, novellas, and novels um, in your it, area? It's been sort of multi-directional, like almost... Um, Actually, I think at this point, every novel or, or novel series that I've got out there has at least one piece of related short fiction that I have written for it. So I've definitely done the thing where I've written long stuff <clears throat> and then thought of smaller, more mm -hmm. like bite-sized things mm -hmm. that I can do in that setting. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, but then there are ha there have been a few things where um, there's one trilogy that I'm working on, kind of developing right now. It's not sold yet. That basically came about because I wrote a short story called The Share at Mask that was in Beneath Ceaseless Skies a few years ago, and when I gave it to friends to read and comment on before I started submitting it, there was a whole lot of "Ooh, this is really fun. Are you planning on doing more here?" And I was like, "No, wait." Maybe. Mm. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so that one did start as a short story and then kind of spawned, uh, a, ideally, a trilogy. Um, one which, strangely, is not going to quite be in continuity with the short story, uh, because in the course of developing the trilogy, I needed to add in things that mm -hmm. were not congruent sure. with what I'd said in the short story. Sure. And I decided, you know what, I'm just going to be okay with mm -hmm. that and, and let that go, right. because I don't want to shackle the books mm -hmm. to what I made up for a 5,000-word you know, I want. Bit. I need an opinion here. Okay. Because we've had others. You said blah 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 as if of course it will be a, a of course it will be a trilogy. You know. Uh. <clears throat> Let's. Un Do you mind if I unpack that just a little bit? Go ahead. Is it uh, a trilogy because oh it's awesome and trilogies sell and agents love them and publishers adore them when they can get at least three books? Is it I have a story arc and it's going to need three sections to tell? Is it? Tell, tell me yeah. about why you said, of course, trilogy. Yeah. Um, I Well, I said, of course, because I had mentioned it as a trilogy already. Uh, but um, weirdly, I'm told that right now publishers are interested in standalones. And so several of the other ideas I'm developing are just one-off things, uh, which is good because sometimes I look at an idea and think, I, I don't think there's more there. I think there's just that thing and it's going to be done and that's it. Um, <clears throat> now, how, how do you know that is a good question. And... Uh, in some ways, I think this is, I, I was going to say one of the hardest things to teach, but almost I'm not sure it can be taught because the, the word that I tend to use for it, I got this from uh, the writer Marissa Lingen. She talked about it at one point as proprioception, which is the sense you have of where your own body is. Like, I do not need to look at my feet to know where my feet are. Um, 
and I, I think it's a similar kind of thing with stories that after a while you start to build up, I think just through experience, a sense of here's roughly how much idea there is here. And every so often you're wildly wrong. But uh, more often than not, you do have a sense of it. And in this case, it was something where when I thought, okay, how do I tell more stories about this character? Um, the key thing that is not in the short story that will be in the novels because I was trying to think, okay, it, it's this character who is a like master thief, con artist, quick change disguise, you know, kind of flamboyant uh, uh, pulp adventure sort of thing. Um, partly inspired by all things a uh, like... 1911 silent film or something about this woman who like flies around in an airship and steals gems and disguises herself as a man and flirts with the ladies and all this stuff. And I'm like, yes, we need more of this. That was where the, the short story came from. But and now it, I'm, do you remember the name of the movie? Cause I will, total, uh, I'm, I'm going to link all these in our podcast. Yes, uh, that, Philibus, so. which Philibus. I, think, I think it has two L's F I L L I B U S, but it might mm-hmm. be just one. L. We, we will remember. look up for that dear yeah. readers. <laughs> um, and well, and I, I've got a link to a review of it um, on my website, which I can send you the link. Cause the oh, review yeah. will, it's a hard thing to find. It survives in like one copy that's like Dutch or something like that. So it's not an easy thing to find. Excellent. But I can link to the review and people can enjoy the uh, the description of it. Um, but anyway, I with that one, when I was trying to think, okay, how do I make a novel plot out of this? Because you need something larger than just here's a caper at the end. Um, what I came up with is that she is actually possessed by a trickster spirit. Um, and I came up with a story for <clears throat> how this happened because I thought, we don't want to do the origin story. Origin stories are boring. We want to leap into the part where she's already the master criminal and doing cool things. So this is her backstory that, of how she became possessed by this. Um, the trickster spirit is nowhere in the short story. But when I thought up the idea of her having the spirit in her, I then thought up an arc for what's going to happen with that. Because I didn't just want it to be, here is a thing, and it will never cause any problems whatsoever. Like, no, the it's end. a trickster. <laughs> like, I know, the tr- tricksters are kind of inherently something sitting on Chekhov's mantle. Um, and in that one... That fell out in a fashion where I thought, okay, yes, this this feels very nicely to me, a three-part structure of you will have this, you will have these complications happen, you will have the resolution, and it would play out better if it were not done all within one book because then there's more time to develop that. Or with the memoirs of Lady Trent, I pitched that as a five-book series because I knew it was going to build up to there was a particular discovery that she was very famous for having made, and the last book was going to be the story of that discovery. But because it's about this... um, I realized I haven't described them. Uh, The memoirs of this uh, lady adventurer and dragon naturalist. So she is a scientist who travels the world to study dragons in their natural habitat. And I wanted each book to be a different expedition to a different part of the world. Um, And so with that one, I wanted it to feel like, no, she really has had a career. And the big discovery that comes at the end is building on smaller discoveries that happened along the way. I did pick five somewhat arbitrarily. Um, Three felt too short. I could have done four, but I had different places I wanted to go to. So, okay, five. Sure. And and it seemed like I I remember reading one of them. Weren't you in – it was like – Wandering the Himalayas. Uh, she she goes to basically the Himalayas in the last book. Yeah. Yes, that was, yeah. that was the last one that I remember. Yeah. See, yeah. I did read one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did a bunch of research on yeah. uh, mountain climbing and concluded that people who do things like climb Everest are, are crazy. Out of their gourds. Well, wait a second. <laughs> Let us remember that the slopes of Everest are filled with the corpses of very driven people. Yeah. Very yeah. energetic driven And it people. is sobering to think that, yeah, when if you decide that you're going to go climb Everest, be aware, you will be climbing past the dead bodies mm-hmm. of people who tried to do the same thing, and their bodies could not even be retrieved. Like, just sit with that thought for a moment before yeah. you decide you want I'm to I'm waiting for somebody to write the space story of that, of, you know, the, the line of corpses that are, you know... <laughs> Yeah. Orbit around in the asteroid belt. Yeah, but um, that's gross. Either that, or somebody writes the zombie Everest story. But <laughs> mm. now I do like the clarity of the, and this is going to sound weird, but the blocking of your fight scenes. Oh yeah, I really enjoyed the way that I could see very clearly in that when somebody's because it was sometimes people write fight scenes and it's like blah 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 fight chairs crash fling oh and people I think the way people write it is chaos because they feel like they're chaos well and there that is a valid way of doing it I will say is that um 
if you're really in the middle of a fight, it is very rarely a, a clear, I know exactly where everybody is and what they're doing. Like, no. I mean, if I'm sparring in karate, I rarely even know what the person in front of me is doing because that requires conscious thought that isn't happening. Um, but I did do uh, combat choreography for theater for four years when I was in college. And so that actually shaped a lot of how I think about choreographing scenes for fiction in terms of, at the very least, I, the writer, need to know where everybody is and what they're doing, even if then the way that I render it on the page is more, ah, <laughs> you know, chaotic and the, the character is completely confused and panicking. Yeah. Um, if I don't have a clear sense of it, then in particular, when I come back to revise it, I will look at it and go, I have no idea what was going on here. Do you, do you chart it out on paper? I will draw maps for myself. Yeah. yeah um, I've got an ebook called Writing Fight Scenes that contains um, – uh, some scans of a couple of the maps that right. I sketched out for. So when you say you've got an ebook, you wrote an ebook. <clears throat> yes, I, I wrote an ebook that is cleverly titled "Writing Fight Scenes." Uh, we'll you would put never a link know up. what it's we'll about. We'll put a link up. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I scanned in some of the maps that I wrote for mm -hmm. the Doppelganger books, which were my first series. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and yeah, I would draw things like little arrows on them, showing where everybody was going, and like little squares like okay there's a table there i mean they're not pretty they don't have to be pretty the only purpose of them is to make sure that you can look at it and remember how things were moving and where things were that's that's good my, my challenge has always been i forget who's carrying what exactly you, know? yeah, yeah. you need a very distinct physical sense and i've come to realize that it's not just fight scenes but that i do tend to think almost like um sort of kinetically about scenes that I'm writing. If, if movement is important to the scene, then I'm seeing it a lot through the standpoint of where are people moving to, how are they, like what's their posture and things like that. That's a, that's a good way of summing up the, if movement is pivotal to the scene, because that's not even just fight scenes, is right. it? Right. There's a lot of... Oh, yeah. One of the, the things that I've commented on in the past, I think I even say this in the ebook, is that the technical challenges of a fight scene and a sex scene are very nearly identical. <laughs> oh, God, yes. Because in both cases, you are describing bodies in movement doing repetitive actions over and over, and you need to make this interesting without descending into horribly purple prose. <laughs> yes. yes. Please, can we pick one word for that object? I just, you know... Yeah, like you do not need to come up with a different term every single time either a sword or a body part gets mentioned, so... That's true. It's my sword. It's not my trusty blade. It's not yeah. my... And, and please don't ever my, call a weapon a tool. Oh, and... Uh, or that actually applies to the sex scenes as well. Take, the word tool is you know, right out. Take sticker. Let's <laughs> no. just agree that nobody's ever going to use it for anything ever again. <laughs> not a sex scene, not a not fight, fight scene. scene. Yeah, yeah. There's certain words that should just unless be... Unless you're writing a genuine pig sticking scene. Well, yes. Yeah, so if you are putting a pig on a spit to roast it or something, you yes. are allowed. And I could see, you know, as a, a sort of like farcical thing in a fight scene of like, oh, you know, what are you going to do with that little pig sticker? But in the actual narration. When you think no. about it, pig stickers are huge. Yes, they, they are. These are people that have clearly never barbecued a pig in their whole life because. <laughs> oh, 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 hang on. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Pig sticking is hunting wild boar. Yes. It's not mm. putting. Oh, it is not the spit. It's okay, not the spit. It, it is no, the no, spear. No, it's, well, it's boar spear. spears yeah. are also oh, massive huge. things for yeah. very good reason. Yeah. Because you don't want the boar to run oh, all the way down. But, it but it, that's you. the crossbar here. Yeah, you know, run this far, but no for further. Very good you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, so I, I did some historical fencing years ago, um, and now I am uh, studying Shodanu karate. I got my black belt a few years ago. Uh, so that all feeds into the fight scene stuff. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a panel in two and a half hours on that topic, which Ooh. your podcast listeners sadly will not be able to attend. But <laughs> maybe, maybe there would be an extra microphone on the thing. Just saying things happen. <laughs> It, I don't think they let us. No, no. I'm pretty sure it's actually against California law for you to do that without getting our permission. <laughs> but it's it's the clarity. I, I think that is a good point, and I like the, the way that you put it of knowing that because if it's a book about sports, if it's a book about anything, if the clarity, yeah. if it's a dancing, the clarity of movement through physical space. Yeah. And I mean, even just like a, a confrontation, like a verbal confrontation mm -hmm. between people, if you've got somebody who is like, you know, moving to try to get away from the, the conversation if they're uh, like stalling or, or dodging by going to like fiddle with things in different parts of the room. Movement can still be a part of that and it helps you avoid the problem of a scene that is just two heads in space talking at each other. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the Statler and Waldorf of space idea is yeah. its own bit of amusement. I, I would say like, you know, that can also be done incredibly well, but it, you know, this gives you some variety. Okay, that makes perfect sense. 
Um, we will be putting links to the mm. things that we've talked about here. So I'll be going back to Marie and saying, okay, let's <laughs> give how did you find that movie, etc. And other interesting things that came up briefly, even in passing on the website, which is www.ridersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can find us on t- Facebook or Twitter. We answer email. If you any of you want to reach out and email a question to Marie, we will relay it and get answers for you. Uh, she certainly loves hearing from fans. So if anybody wants to write on her website and tell them how awesome she is, please feel free. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the host. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schween and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsor is Jackal Designs, enabling you all to buy cool WDC swag, including the latest... Live at Mally's, recorded on the world's prettiest microphone, now available on our website. 